Thank you for being here. I know uh, I have a strong competition with Andrew on the, in the other room, but uh, uh, I will try to not get too disappointed. So today, the talk I, I will present is going literate in Amadeus. So I work for Amadeus. Uh, I will just talk about it a bit later. Uh, but uh, first, a few words about me. So I'm Vincent Latombe, uh, aka V Latombe. I work as a developer advocate at Amadeus. And uh, I used to build a lot of uh, Java G2E projects. Uh, but now, since uh, this year, I also do more technologies, uh, C++ project, Python, Ruby. Uh, so it's a more versatile environment that I, uh, I used to. But you get to adapt, and uh, so we do new things. I've been using Jenkins since uh, 2010. Uh, I started as, uh, taking the maintenance of the Kirkis plugin from Andrew in the other room. And uh, I've done some contributions on the Jenkins core. We run a pretty big Jenkins instance on uh, Windows and uh, had to do some fixes to get it work properly. Uh, and from time to time, I contribute to the Git plugin. Uh, now I spend most of, uh, most of my contribution time uh, on the literate plugin with, that I will present today. So the, our, my agenda for today, uh, first, what is literate? Um, it's a concept you may not know about. Uh, we'll show you a bit of a demo of various scenarios that you can run with the literate plugin. Uh, we talk a bit about uh, our deployment uh, of literate and Amadeus, some uh, modification we have done and we plan to contribute to the open source project. And then my last part will be uh, like taking a look uh, under the hood of the plugin, what implication it had on the, gen on the platform and what are the potential for the, for the future. So first, what is literate? Or should I say what the fuck is literate, as uh, Stephen Connolly would say? <laughs> Uh, so, first, literate programming. I don't know if you heard about the concept. It has been invented by uh, Donald Knuth in 1983. So, uh, Donald Knuth is the, is the guy who invented uh, also LaTeX. I don't know if you heard about this, but if you have written some papers in the past, uh, you probably have. Uh, the idea is to basically write a program, but um, within a natural language text. So you take a piece of text and you interleave some uh, either, p uh, either snippets of code or you use some macros. These macros are implemented with code behind and in the end you get a workable program. Uh, so if we apply the concept to the build, we get the literate builds. It means that we will describe the build steps in a readable file. So the best place for this is uh, the readme file that you can find in any project, or you should find in any project. And it has a big benefit because this file, it is stored in the same SCM as the code it is building. So if you put the build process in there, you're sure that the, the build process uh, will have the same life cycle as the code it is building. And since it is the readme and it is usually the entry point uh, for people to build the project, you make sure your documentation is up to date with your actual build process. Uh, so in literate builds, uh, it, you have the following layout. So basically you put a marker file within the SCM. So for the literate plugin by default, this file is named uh, .cloudbees.md. Uh, this file may contain or not the build definition, and if it is empty, uh, it will fall back to the readme, which makes it convenient to have the, the build definition directly in the readme. Um, so I will now show you some examples uh, before going through the practice. Uh, so first, for some of you that may not be uh, at ease with uh, the markdown, which is used to usually write the readmes uh, on projects, uh, in markdown, you have a section name followed by a line filled with equals, sign, or uh, just dashes. You can put text, so it's just raw text. Uh, you can have inline code between backticks. And then you can have a block of code. Uh, if you first put a new, uh, an empty line, then a line that is beginning by four space characters. 
So you get the graphical rendering uh, on the side. And now let's go over a few examples of what you can do. So this is a very, very basic example. So we have a Hello World Iterate project. This Hello World, this readme, it contains a section that is named Build. So the name of the section is important. It's actually how the plugin will recognize that this is a section that contains uh, build steps. Then inside this section, we expect to find a, co a code block uh, that contains the, the commands that we want to execute. So here it's just a plain hello world. It's just for, for the example. If we put this in a repository, we put the marker file on the side, we execute this, we'll get simply the hello world executed. Uh, let's take a bit more complex example. So, of course, if you do echo hello world, most of the time it will work because all the, all the modern OS, they implement the echo command. But if you want to do a real build, uh, usually you will need tools. You will need a specific environment to run on. And uh, in literate, this can be done by using a section that is called environments. And in this section, you can define one or many environments that will be the constraint and the execution environment for your project. So here, this is an example with Ant. We have the environment section. It contains uh, a list with one item. This item contains two labels, Ant uh, 1.8 and Java 1.7. So I can put more labels if I want to put more constraints. I can have uh, several env environments if I want. Uh, here it's just only one. And then I have the build section, which contains an ant command. And the fact that I've declared the ant 1.8 and Java 1.7 uh, will make sure that in the path uh, when the build command uh, is executed, I have uh, ant 1.8 installation declared. And the Java home is set to uh, Java 1.7 installation. And the path also contains uh, Java path to the Java 1.7. Uh, if I want to do matrix builds, I just have to declare multiple environments. And then the build, when running, will just uh, fork uh, two different builds, uh, one build executing in each environment. So here I have a, an additional example, one on Linux, one on Windows, each with his own tool chain, so one JCC, one Visual Studio, and plus a uh, Java, standard Java environment. Um, if I take a look at the build commands for such a setup, uh, I can see I can also um, have build commands that are specific to a given environment. This can be useful in case I cannot have exactly the same command on both environments. Here in this case, on, if I have an environment that contains the GCC 4.2, which, which is the case of the Linux environment I showed before, uh, then I will execute this command. And on the other hand, if I have an environment with Visual Studio Pro 2012, I will execute this over batch command. Uh, the matching will be done with the, just like CSS, it will be done with the uh, selector, which is the most precise. So if I have, a, let's say, another section that contains, uh, I don't know, both uh, JCC, Linux, uh, Java, etc., then it will be preferred over to the uh, section which I defined here. Um, I can, so until now, I have declared how to uh, build my project, how to, what kind of environment I need to build my project. Um, so I can just build a regular continuous build uh, and do some compilation tests, etc., uh, which is run usually after each commit. If I want to run additional tasks, uh, typically a release task or integration test or manual or things that I don't want to execute every time or I want to execute it only if some prior step have been successful. I can define uh, additional tasks so just by with a separate section. So the standard section is build, but I can define a section like release and uh, it will be my release build. And through the configuration of the job, I will be able to say, okay, this release task, I want to uh, execute it uh, either as a next step to the build, or I want to execute it with a manual promotion step. So someone comes in, sees that the 
continuous build has, uh, has been successful, clicks on a button, and then it triggers the release build uh, based on the same commit that produced the initial build. Of course, uh, if I talk about releasing, uh, releasing uh, it does not really make sense uh, on a development branch. So you can define restrictions that says, for instance, uh, only on the master branch of my Git repository, I want to be able to um, execute my release process, but on any other branch, I don't want it. Uh, you can also write extensions. So basically, right now, we're just talking about command line. Uh, so we execute commands, uh, we use the console, but we don't benefit of any of the Jenkins plugins that provide us these nice, nice UI reports. So in Literate, this is done through uh, agents, uh, I mean, extensions that you can put in the SCM. Uh, by default, it's uh, supposed to be in a Jenkins and dot Jenkins folder for each um, each action that you want to run after you build. So typically, uh, archive uh, artifact, collect JUnit report, do whatever n whatever step that you would put normally in a freestyle job under the post build section. You can create a file. So the, the basic, the very basic implementation is to put the XML file that contains the configuration snippet for this plugin. And if you, if the plugin has implemented uh, an extension point exposed by the literate plugin, which is called agent, then you can put something that is much simpler. For instance, for uh, arch archiving a file, you just need to provide the pattern of the files that you want to archive, and you don't need to, to put the, the full XML snippet. Uh, so it's time for the demo. So we'll show you basically the different examples I've described before. Uh, in so first, uh, I have a repository that is a single branch. So I have a master branch. If I take a look into the configuration for this job, I will see that, okay, it starts pretty much like a freestyle job. So I have the name description, etc. I don't have any way to uh, restrict the job to a given label, but you will see that it's possible. Um, I don't have an SCM section. I have a section called branch sources. Uh, and in this section, I can select basically an SCM, uh, which is, where is it? It's here. So here I can select Git, I can select a single source, which is an SCM that does not implement this new extension point. And right now I can select all sorts of versions which support this. The very big difference between this uh, branch source and the SCM is that the branch source is uh, multi-branch aware. Usually with an SCM, you declare uh, a repository and you target only one given branch, except on some exceptions like the Git plugin where you could target all the branch, but this was really an exception. In this schema here, uh, you really work with a full repository. So here, the Git definition, it only targets the Git repository URL. And then the literate multi-branch pro project will make sure that it, it is able to recognize all the branches and build them if they are uh, selected for build. Uh, through properties here, I can define additional parameters. So I can uh, define promotion process like the one I described earlier with the releasing. I can define uh, throttling uh, options like uh, I don't want this build to run more than once an hour, things like that. And I have additional options, but uh, I will just keep them for now. So this uh, job itself, the first process it starts, it's called the branch indexing. This branch indexing, it kind of supersedes the polling system that was used before. It does the same thing as the polling, but it acts on the whole repository. So if I check the logs here, I can see that basically it's just querying my repository say, OK, what branch are there? And then for each branch, uh, it will try to check if it can be built with literate. So here, the criteria is only the existence of the marker file uh, within the, in the root of the, the, SC, of the branch. So if I have a branch which does not have the marker file, 
it will not appear here. So here I have just my master branch. And uh, if it changed since the last build I've made on this branch, then it will trigger a new build of this branch. Um, so if I go, so here I, I ran it a, a few days ago. So if I build it now, it should uh, run pretty quick. If I go to the console, I can see that basically the branch project, it, it's, so this one is working on only one branch. Um, it's cloning the repository, and then it starts parsing the, the marker or the readme in this case, and check what kind of environment are available for this build. So here, it's the first example I showed uh, at the beginning. So it means we have a build command. I, I think if I go to the, to the workspace, I can see it. So I have my, I have my readme. So it's just the, the first example. So it, we have one build section, one command, echo hello world. It's, it's very, very basic. So here we have one default environment because we have no environment section. And then it, it schedules uh, a, an environment build underneath, which is called default if I have no environment. And then this environment build is the, the build that will actually execute the command I have put in my file. So here it's just, uh, it wrapped it in a batch because I'm running Windows. If I were running Linux, it would wrap it in a shell script. And then I just see my command. Um, so that's it for the first example. If I go to uh, uh, the next example, so it's the called the multi-branch. So it's the uh, same repo. I can, I think it's made for, okay. So it's, uh, it's a new repo. This one is, has a, it has multiple branches. Yeah, I will just start from, uh, from scratch to see you how it behaves. So I create my new job. So the literate, it's a new kind of project. So it's really a new section. You, do, you don't have to select. If I, um, OK, I will just create this. OK, now I have my new literate job. I will add the source, and then I add back my uh, local repository, and just save. And here, I can see that on the, first save, it, on the first save, it started the branch indexing. It detected a branch. And uh, normally, if I refresh, I should see, basically, it built my three branches in parallel. And I have the result for all these three branches. And if I take a look into each branch, actually, I have played a bit with the with the content of the readme, so I have customized, uh, I have customized it to, to make it sure that it's different on each branch. And if I take a look within the, within the environment logs, I should see, whoop, I don't know why. Okay. I should see here I'm working on branch one, and if I switch to branch two, I should see something. If I switch on branch two, I get branch two, and I think you get the point for the rest. Um, the last example I wanted to show you is uh, when you have multiple environment declared. So here, I have cheated a bit. I have only uh, a Jenkins master. I have no slaves. So uh, I tricked it, and I, I added two labels on my master. So if I go, uh, I think I go here, go to configuration. Okay, here uh, it's both like Windows and Linux. But if I had only one, only Windows and another node with Linux, it would just dispatch correctly. So multi-environment. So I'm back to one branch. If I check the branch content, I have my two environments, and I have the same command on both environments. So I, as I showed in the previous slide, you can put a different commands if you wish. If I, if I launch this build, so it should, yeah, okay. Okay, it's already run, so let's take a look. So it, at the branch level, it has uh, parsed again the marker file or the readme. So here it found two environments, and then it launched the both environments in parallel and wait for, the, for them to, to finish. 
And then at the end, uh, at the branch level, you get the logic end between the, the two environments. So it's pretty much equivalent to what you can find with uh, the matrix uh, jobs at the, at the given time. You have a few limitations, but I'm working on them to, to limit the gap. OK, let's come back uh, to the demo. Ah, sorry. I don't know where my pointer is. OK. OK, so part three is about uh, my specific context uh, where I work in Amadeus. So we have about uh, 3,000 developers. I don't have the exact count, so it's, uh, it's several thousands for sure. Uh, historically, we've been working with uh, uh, IBM assembly. We don't work that much with that anymore. We do a lot of C++ uh, backends. Uh, and uh, we have all our front office products, so usually the airline.com. Uh, so if you go to, uh, I don't know, uh, website Lufthansa, uh, any, any big airline, uh, we, we are mostly behind at least the booking process. And uh, of course, for internal tooling, uh, you can add a scripting language, Python, Ruby, and Perl, and probably uh, more of them. I don't know about all of them. So the idea is that uh, we have a very heter uh, heterogeneous uh, environment, and uh, it's uh, kind of difficult to handle everything, so we try to, to put uh, some control back into the developer's hand. Uh, so historically, we did not have, we have several divisions, one for each technology, and depending on the division, we had different strategies. Uh, one of them is to run a fully open Jenkins, no security, uh, usually uh, one per team, and then the team can do whatever they want on them. But of course, it's a mess because they don't upgrade it. They don't really know how to make the best use of it. And uh, you have no consistency between the different uh, teams. You have no central dashboard where you can see everything. Uh, in another division, the one I was working, in, well, the one I was working in, we had a fully locked down Jenkins uh, with basically developers. They had read access but they could maybe build some jobs they were uh, responsible of, but they had no way, uh, they w there was no way they could configure the jobs. It was all handled by a central team. Uh, over the time, uh, we tried to get more balanced scenario. So we, uh, we bought Jenkins Enterprise at the time. We were interested by the templates uh, because it gave the, uh, the flexibility of exposing uh, some of the configuration, but in the end, you, get, you still have the control on the final configuration. We also have a lot of uh, parallel branches development, so we have a lot of jobs with similar configuration, but not the same, so it, it, it was the perfect scenario. And then, uh, now we're investing in literate, so... Um, the big difference with literate is that you can version uh, everything in the SCM. Uh, even with the template solution, we had some issues like, okay, I have a, basically most of my branches, they are building the same, and then someone comes in and then they want to do some uh, changes in the build process, and then you have this specific branch that needs to be built in a specific way. And it's difficult to, even with templates, to make that happen. With literate, it's just... Uh, it's trivial. You just uh, change the build descriptor in your branch, and when your branch gets merged, then the build process gets merged uh, with it. Um, some words about the infrastructure we're using. So we are using Atlassian Stash. So for, you, for those of you who don't know, it's just like GitHub, but within the enterprise. Uh, we have a Jenkins instance. Um, on the Stash instance, people, any developer, they can create projects, they can create repositories. So projects is just like uh, uh, the uh, it's just like the teams in, in GitHub. And they can create repositories. And uh, from the Stash interface, they have this simple checkbox, enable continuous integration. They just tick it. This triggers a process on the Jenkins side that creates a literate multi-branch project, the one I showed you before. Uh, this literate project, it will index the branches, so it will look at the guy repository, uh, take a peek in the readme or in the descriptor, 
it will create the branches uh, based on the number of branches it has. It will pass the marker, generate the environment builds uh, for, to, to build the specific uh, build for this repository. And then uh, once it's done, it will publish the build status in Stash. It's just like GitHub, you have a decorator at, uh, on each commit. You can see if a build has run, and you can see the status for this build. Uh, we, in Amadeus, uh, we initially, I present, I mean, it come, uh, we, we were thinking about doing something based on uh, a descriptor in the SCM for some time. Um, and then, uh, in, I think it was in, in around September, the, the announcement for Literate came in. It was the perfect timing. This was just about this time we were thinking about it. And um, we started to invest uh, on it. And there were some things. Uh, the, default, um, the default format for the descriptor was in the README. And internally, uh, we had uh, different opinions about uh, what should be the, the description format. And uh, overall, internally, uh, YAML won. Um, so in the end, we just wrote a YAML builder for literate. Uh, it was easy because uh, actually uh, the, the architecture of the plugin uh, and the API behind was very flexible. Uh, the model itself had no tie with Markdown, so you could just write another builder that reads a different uh, raw model, in, in our case YAML, and uh, build the same model as what was built with the Markdown, and then have the similar result. Uh, so just to give you a side-by-side -side comparison between Markdown and YAML, so uh, yeah, that's, YAML is more uh, close to a data structure and it leaves uh, less area for errors, uh, particularly with Markdown every time I try to do some things. I put a code, of, uh, a code block and then I forget that I, have, I need to have a blank line before a new code block and then uh, my parsing just failed, and I don't understand why my thing does not build. So with, uh, with YAML, uh, the grammar is a bit simpler. Of course, you lose the fact that uh, you are using your readme before uh, to uh, document your build process, but we, you, you still have a file that is pretty much readable, and you can have your build process in this. So overall, I think it's worth, it was worth it. So now, the last part. So until now, I did a pretty much functional description of what is going on, and now we're going to go a bit deeper. So the architecture of the plugin, uh, first, it's uh, split into different plugins. Uh, on top, you have, of course, the literate plugin, which is the one you are interacting, it, uh, you are interacting with uh, when you create literate jobs. But behind, you have an API that has no links with Jenkins, so you can just you, you could just write a literate plugin for another CI engine. You could write a, a command line wrapper, whatever you like. Uh, there are two other plugins uh, that are the foundation for the literate, uh, so the SCM API and the branch API. So let's go a bit in detail in there. Um, so literate API it collects everything that is to uh, pass a file and make it a project model. This thing is, it has no tie to Jenkins, as I said, and there is already a project that is a, a common line wrapper that is doing uh, just, uh, you give it an environment, you give it a, f a description file, and it gives you the, build, the corresponding build command. So you could just have a tool that is uh, launching your build locally and will have one command, whatever the underlying uh, build tool you're using, Maven, Ant, Gradle, uh, Make, uh, whatever. Uh, the SCM API, it introduced uh, a new class, which is the SCM source, so it's a new extension point. Uh, it's the one I showed you before in the, in the literate job configuration. Um, so the main point is that it interacts with multiple heads on the remote repository. So you can say, uh, okay, I have uh, just uh, my, as my subversion server and then it passes all the branches. For Git, it's the same. Uh, internally, we wrote uh, something to integrate with a stash pull request. Uh, and you could do uh, the same as done for GitHub, I know, but uh, he doesn't want to open source. So Stefan doesn't want to open source it because it's, uh, uh, it may be a security issue. Uh, the branch API, 
basically, it's uh, everything that you need uh, to work with multiple branches. So you have things which I've showed you before in the menu. Uh, you have politics to handle uh, when a branch disappears, what do you do with the corresponding builds? Uh, you can say, OK, um, these pull requests, uh, these branches that come from GitHub or Stash, um, I don't trust them. Anyone could have put some code in there, uh, hacked my build uh, step, and if I use the, the build to do my releasing, I, I don't want them to have access to my credentials. I don't want to have any rights. So I can flag some branches as, as being interested, and they can be run into a more uh, secured environment. You can configure the build retentions and say it's just the same as you would with a regular freestyle. Uh, and you can c configure throttling. So as I said, you can say, OK, this project, they are doing way too many builds. I will just uh, throttle their builds, and they cannot do one. Uh, I mean, they can just do one build every hour, and not more. Uh, this branch API, it's the, I mean, it's the foundation for maybe future plugins. So you can imagine a multi-branch freestyle project, just like a regular freestyle project, but you have multiple branches. Only restriction, you need to have the exact same build process for each branch. Uh, and then if you integrate with some things from CloudBees, you could imagine a template that is creating a multi-branch project and then uh, do uh, addition, more cool stuff with it. And last but not least, the plugin, the, the literate plugin is this thing that is the glue to everything. Uh, it exposes new extension points. The main one is the literate branch property. So basically, this allows you at configuration time to inject whatever things you need in the branch project or environment project. So for instance, uh, in our case, in Amadeus, we, uh, we did a branch property that just inject a publisher that published the build, the build status back to Stash. So people in their project, they don't need to declare anything, and they get for free the reporting to Stash. And Agents, they are the ones that basically make the uh, reporting and post-build action more usable uh, by uh, project owners. Um, using, using, uh, if you implement an agent for a plugin, it means that you will expose whatever file format that you want the user to see. Uh, so if your publisher just has a simple string to configure it, you just expose this string in the file, and then on your side, you uh, build new publisher instances. If you don't do that, uh, it means that uh, they have to check in a snippet of XML, uh, of XML, and every time the plugin will change, uh, then uh, it may be broken. So this uh, literate plugin, branch API, for now, they, you cannot see them if you install a Jenkins and then uh, you go to the update center. They are released as a beta version, and in the Jenkins world, it means that uh, any plugin annotated with beta, it will, it will, it will be published to uh, an, alternate, uh, an experimental update center. You can configure your Jenkins instance to target this experimental update center uh, if you want to test some of the beta plugin. So if you follow a bit uh, the mailing list, uh, you can see sometimes people, they say, OK, I, have, I did this new feature. Uh, I released the beta. Uh, you can use the experimental update center to test it. So uh, for literate, what would be necessary to make it a proper release? Um, the main things I see, it's just a short list. There is, a, I think, uh, Stephen wrote a blog article some time ago about the a full list of items that he wishes to be in implemented in literate. That we just focus on the one that I think matters the most. Um, for me, what's important is to have a wide plugin uh, integration, mostly for uh, agents and potentially for branch properties as well. So you can, on your side, have the flexibility when you configure a literate job to say, OK, this thing, I want to configure it as if I was in a freestyle job because I consider it something that is uh, not, uh, not something I want to expose to people committing to the repository. Uh, also, for agents, of course, it's uh, more user-friendly if you uh, expose a simple text file or, uh, if you ex than if you expose an XML. Internally, I'm also working on a way to uh, have this directly in the, in the description file. 
So instead of having, if you, have, if you want, for instance, uh, to collect JUnit, instead of putting a file in the .jenkins slash and then JUnit.lst, I think, you could just have a section in your, in, in our case, it's on a, uh, in our YAML file, you could just have a section called JUnit and then you can put a pattern or you don't put a pattern if you just want to use the default pattern and then it collects it. So you don't, everything is in one file and I think it's really a good direction to have everything in one file that is uh, persisted to the SCM. Uh, of course, there is the pull request support uh, for most uh, social um, uh, repositories. So internally, I have Stash. So we'll probably, I mean, I hope we will be able to release it as open source uh, later this year. And I know Stefan has done the, the implementation for GitHub, but you will see in the next point, that's why he doesn't want to release it. Uh, but probably uh, it will come. And the same for Bitbucket, it would be great if it was implemented. I think it's a very similar implementation, so it shouldn't be that hard. Uh, and last but not least, so integration with uh, isolation features. So right now, I talked about untrusted branches, but basically, uh, unless you have some kind of virtual machines or Docker containers, you cannot do that efficiently. Um, so right now, all the commands that you put in your descriptor, they are just wrapped into regular uh, shell or a batch command. Um, but if you imagine that you wrap this in a docker run command, uh, then uh, your build is, uh, is isolated, and uh, you can have different docker containers depending on what you need. And so once this is implemented, I think the pretty much all the rest will just uh, be unblocked. So that, that's it about uh, my presentation. I think we have some minutes left if you have any questions about uh, literate or anything that is related to what I just presented. <laughs>